This is a film made about uh, the oral history of Stockport Labour Party. Uh, it's comprised of people's memories over the last 40 years or so from the uh, early 1960s up to um, uh, today. Uh, the Labour Party in Stockport didn't control the local council until 1954 when it controlled it for some years and again in the early 1970s. Uh, we didn't have a Labour MP in Stockport until 1964. Uh, two Conservatives were elected uh, to the council in the 1945 election. Since then, quite a lot has happened and I think you'll find uh, this uh, uh, series of comments from local people who actually experienced what went on and their memories will be very interesting. This is Andrew Bennett. He was the MP uh, in Stockport North and following out Denton Reddish for 30 years. And he's got a lot of stories to tell uh, about what happened when he got elected and the various things that have happened in Stockport over many, many years. Over to you, Andrew. Right, well, I suppose the thing to remind people of is that Stockport actually had Labour MPs in the 1912 uh, and 1920s sort of period. But sadly, in 1945, at Stockport um, didn't go like so many other uh, boroughs which had two members Labour. It stayed staunchly uh, Conservative, which was, I think, pretty disappointing for the local party since they'd been quite well organised. And again in 1950, uh, they just failed, but it was getting pretty close. By the 1951 election, of course, when it was split into North and South, the Tories and Liberals did a deal by which the Liberals wouldn't stand in the general election, uh, the Tories wouldn't stand in various wards in the, uh, the town, and again Labour just failed. And the same happened in '55, the by-election as well, and uh, when it got to 1959, Stan Orm was the candidate in Stockport South, and there were great hopes that he would actually manage to win it, and right up to handing in nominations, there was going to be a Liberal candidate. And I think if there'd been a Liberal candidate, he would have won. He certainly felt he would have won, and so did Alf Lomas, who was his agent at that uh, stage. Uh, but they didn't, and uh, there was considerable disappointment after the 59 election. OK. When I was uh, selected for Stockport, I think one of the things that shocked me almost more than anything else was the state that the old housing was in Stockport. Stockport Labour Party, in control of the council between sort of in various periods from 45 up to 1974, had done pretty well with building some very good council housing. I mean, Brennington was a fantastic estate when it was first built. And there was some good housing in North Reddish that was built at the, the same time. But nothing had been done about the old terraces except in a few places knock them down. Mm. And the first time I went out canvassing in Edgeley, I went out with Margaret Hayes. And we'd been working, it was a nice May evening, oh, I suppose it might be April evening. We'd been knocking a few doors and then I suddenly saw these three or four rats in the streets playing more or less about and I was pretty shocked and what shocked me even more was when I pointed them out to Margaret uh, Hayes she didn't actually uh, express any horror she just almost implied that that was normal for Stockport <laughs> and so I was pretty appalled by it and there was some pretty bad housing uh, in Reddish mm. and particularly in Edgeley one of the things that we achieved by the Labour government in the 70s was to get these urban renewal schemes going, first in Edgeley, uh, then in Heaton Norris, and then up in um, North Reddish, well, in the whole of Reddish. Mm. And they really made a difference. Now, I did pretty well when I got into Parliament in making the maiden speech the first night, talking about housing, and uh, that had two effects. One was that it pushed housing pretty high up my agenda, but it also was a nice rebuff to the Tories, 
because of course they had two Tory MPs in for Stockport who were notorious for saying nothing and I managed to get in quickly mm. and it was I think one of the things that helped me. But the achievement in actually turning the housing round, I did claim some credit for it in getting Stockport allocated the resources. But it was also an illustration of where really good councillors made a difference. And as far as the Edgley scheme was concerned, uh, it was Vincent Holland who put in a huge amount of effort so that not only was the scheme done and done very well, but local people were pleased with it. And I think uh, it's a tribute to the Labour Party's efforts that there is a lot of very good old terraced housing in Edgley. Mm. Um, the same happened in Heaton Norris. Uh, I think it was Des Green who was the councillor for yeah. most of the effort there. And a little bit later, Reddish, where yourself, um, perhaps not to mention it, but Anne Graham put in a lot of effort. Mm. What's interesting is because of the effort to get them done, but the way in which local people were consulted and able to have their say, all those three housing renewal areas have held up remarkably well. Mm. So you can go to housing renewal in an awful lot of the areas to the north of Manchester and you can see those areas that have slipped back and lost their attractions, whereas as far as Stockport's concerned, they actually have lasted. And I think there are an awful lot of people who are living in those now who are very proud of them as owner occupiers. Mm. Um, pretty good work. Also, there was a lot of environmental work done at the same time um, by young unemployed people. Mm. Um, so that was, I think, one of, I would claim, my achievements, but also very much the Labour Party in Stockport making an effort. Of course. My name is Gwen Scott. I joined the Labour Party in the late 60s. I can't remember how we joined. I know it seemed difficult at the time. I remember my first branch meeting. It was at Mary Morley's house. Now, Mary lived in a road off Heaton Moor Road. Um, I can remember the meeting. The local MP, Arnold Gregory, was there. And it was a full house because people were sitting on the floor. And George Peters was there, and I can remember he was kneeling in front of me, and I noticed his socks. They were dark blue, but darned with light blue wool. And this this was in the days when we darned our socks. We weren't to, uh, we were still we weren't into the, th the throwaway society. And that's it. Uh, here we have Tom Grandy, who's uh, who's the group whip at the moment uh, in 2011. But he and Andy have just been talking about people they remember, Bernard Bradbury, Arthur Bradbury and Alan Mobbs and people like that. So Tom, would you like to tell us a bit about some of the people you remember uh, back in the uh, 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s and all the arguments that went on and what happened then? Well, yeah, I remember joining the party, which was... Uh, in must have been about 83 when I first joined the party, I think it was. And uh, me and a friend of mine called Jed Keefe uh, went up to the, uh, the fir tree, that's where North Reddish had the meetings at the time. And uh, a week later, I think I was chair. Uh, you, <laughs> you got promoted very quickly in those that, days. That's, that's um, uh, yeah, Labour uh, Party rules. Both, uh, both me and Jed were on uh, two or three governing bodies. Uh, it was amazing, a major rise in fame. Then uh, I was, uh, I got in the middle of uh, what was uh, a quite strong political argument in the area at the time where I was trying to deselect de uh, one of our uh, councillors at the time, one, uh, one Bernard Bradbury, a very colourful character. I think many people probably know about him. Uh, but he was all, his own worst enemy. Uh, Bernard, uh, because uh, he, he assumed that everybody was plotting against him. I was one of the few who wasn't plotting against him, me and Jed, although we still got a frosty reception every time we turned up to the TU club to speak to him. 
Uh, <laughs> well, despite that, uh, we we did try to uh, well, we tried to a fair result when it come about for Bernard to be reselected again. But uh, as things happened, he, he was he was removed from um, North Redditch at the time, and I think he then fought um, Kale Green. Green, which. Yeah. He only won by about 26 votes, as I remember at the time, because he was he was quite triumphant, and then he was a bit more, a bit more reserved when he realised he'd only won by 26. But uh, I had lots of dealings with Bernard because then he, he was on the same uh, club committee that uh, I think Peter Scott got involved with in the first place when they had a they had a, a meeting that no one turned up to. Uh, the first first year it was run by a, a committee who was struggling to keep the place open. So then the following year they had an, another meeting and uh, Peter realising I was away walking in the Lake District reconvened it for a week later and uh, persuaded me to take it on for a year. Uh, that was in 1988. Uh, I'm still doing the same job now in uh, 2000 and, well, we're just in 2011. Uh, the club, uh, God, that's had a chequered history as well. Um, when it first opened, um, it was great hopes for the place and it was, it was a great time of campaign as I remember. Uh, Everything seemed to be happening at the time. Then um, it was the we had a very strong anti-apartheid group that met there regularly. We had socials where there was hundred and odd people to to regular. Uh, we had the miners' dispute that, had, although had finished, uh, there was still the activists were carrying on and still still having uh, still having socials. And uh, we had people like Dorothy Fryman and. Uh, What's his name? Ivan, who were uh, local folk singers who uh, yeah, wrote some of their own songs as well. And they they used to fetch over people from Sheffield and various other mining communities, and uh, we'd uh, we'd have a social every so often. Didn't we have Chilean solidarity and Meliantu and things like we that? We had Meliantu, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we had them. They appeared a couple of times. Uh, we fought. Uh, we seem to win all these campaigns eventually, aren't they? Amazing. Mm. Uh, free the uh, free the Birmingham Six. Before that, we had free the Gil uh, Guildford Four, which yeah. uh, Andrew Bennett was very instrumental in. Mm. Um, various disputes. Um, we had the barrel barrel workers. Um, I know they stayed. I know they stayed at Rob Kilby's house. I think the Etty House of House and All. They were there a week or so, watching late night videos. <laughs> Uh, him and his wife used to go to bed at uh, like 10 o'clock and they'd still be up <laughs> two or three in the morning. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a different a different time then and all, all the people were keen to get involved in the activities. Of course, I suppose since we come to Paris, it's not been quite the same. There's not been as, hasn't been that, uh, that excitement to uh, an injustice that seemed to be Rife at the time. Uh... This is Sheila Bailey. She's a member of the Labour group at the moment, has been for quite some time. But uh, Sheila, um, why, why did you join the Labour Party and when was it now? I joined the Labour Party in 1976 and it was the year my daughter was born and I thought that um, this uh, meant that I really had to do something about the future because um, it wasn't too good at the time. I'd been involved in protest groups of one sort or another uh, prior to that, CND mostly, and mm. I had um, been on marches and demonstrations and handed out leaflets but I think I began to realise at that time that if you really want to change something you've got to do it through the political process and the only way to do that is to join a political party. Mm. So I did that in 1976 and um, I continued with the CND work until probably around about 1983, 82, 83 
when I began working for Andrew Bennett, the MP for uh, Denton and Reddish, uh, part-time then, um, and then I continued working for him for the next 25 years. Mm. Um, he couldn't get rid of me. Uh, <laughs> I have to say that he was one of the ones who encouraged me to stand for council. Um, he said that he thought that I would be a good councillor and I blame him entirely for the fact that for the next 20 years I've uh, <laughs> been a councillor and worked very hard at it. So, um, so those were my earliest um, uh, experiences of the Labour Party. Uh, at that time people met in uh, each other's houses. Mm. Um, in, certainly it was um, in the uh, Heaton Mersey ward that became Heaton South. Um, it varied uh, throughout the area where, whose house you were, you were going to meet in. Um, there were meetings at what was then the uh, TUC club in Stockport uh, and in those days um, to go to those meetings you had to be a delegate to the constituency and also in those days there was a queue to do that. Not quite so much these days unfortunately, but um, there were many people who wanted to go for um, the particular political point of view that they had which was not always the same as uh, everybody else and some of the meetings were quite raucous and quite um, aggravated and people were asked to leave I can remember on certain occasions um, although at that time not me. <laughs> Now we've got Philip Harding, he's the deputy leader of the Labour group at the moment, has been for some years. But um, Philip, would you like to tell us why you joined the Labour Party and when was it and who was around at that time? Yes, Peter. Well, I, I joined in 1976. Uh, in a way, it was, uh, it was in the family. My father was a shop steward in the Transport and General Workers Union. Both my mother and father were all, always Labour voters. Uh, and it was because I thought that obviously they were the party that would be best uh, uh, to serve the country's interests really. Um, and uh, the people that were around in that uh, time in the late 1970s, there was a very good branch secretary, a chap called Bert Mobbs, who was a, a chimney sweep and um, also uh, there was his son Alan Mobbs who subsequently became the uh, Labour Group leader. I canvassed for Alan in 1980. I had been taught how to canvass though by Colin Foster in 1976 uh, in North Reddish uh, with uh, Andy the Dye uh, on many uh, a cold and uh, dark night in North Reddish. Um, but, um, there was quite a bit of turmoil, in uh, not in my constituency, which was then Stockport North, but in Stockport South, where Alan Mobbs then lived, uh, before he came to live in, uh, in the new South Reddish Ward, which was 1980 when it was created. And uh, we canvassed the whole of the ward that year, and also his, uh, his sister, Janet, who subsequently became a councillor in Stockport, was involved as well. So it was quite heavily influenced uh, by, the, uh, by the Mobbs family. Uh, in uh, in South Reddish at that time and then when the council became hung in 1984 it was hung for 15 years uh, during part of that period I was the uh, district party secretary uh, and so I had quite a lot to do with the Labour group and Alan Mobbs and uh, eventually in 1999 I managed to get myself selected in Davenport um, I'm not too sure how, how the uh, then Labour group leader thought uh, about that, but uh, I, I was selected in uh, in Davenport. I had hoped to be selected in South Reddish, but that wasn't quite uh, that wasn't quite arrangeable. So um, I've been on the council uh, ever since. Uh, although I had to move really to Wedgley and Gidle Heath, where my wife was already a councillor, because the boundaries were changing and uh, the new uh, Davenport, well, Stepping Hill ward. Uh, was uh, not uh, really a very good proposition at that mm. time. Mm. But I defeated in 1999 an independent who'd left the Labour Party, Max Jones, who's now died. Um, and uh, that was uh, really the, uh, the origin of it.
Right, this is John Farrell. He's the political assistant to the uh, leader of the opposition. And he came here from uh, Newcastle, where he came from somewhere else before that, but uh, or after that, I should say. But uh, he had some experience uh, as a city councillor in Newcastle. And he said when he came here, he uh, uh, said that he felt the council felt like it did in Newcastle when he was there, in that uh, it was rotting away slightly. Perhaps, John, you'd like to comment on that and how you find things here. Are they different from Newcastle? Um, well, yeah, the, 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 there's a definite sense that the, the, the controlling group have, have been in power for quite a while now and stopped having new ideas and decent ideas quite a while ago as well. Um, it, it's, I think the, the similarity with Newcastle is that um, on paper they have a big majority um, they they feel very secure, but the the thing is that these things change quite quick, and when when they do change, it is a quick process. You don't always see it coming, and uh, the colleagues at Newcastle didn't, on the whole, see it coming until uh, polling day. Um, it's it's very obvious as well that the officers are in control, and where things do happen, they're generated by officers. There's there's never any sense that anything happens here because a member of the executive has had a fantastic idea uh, that they've pushed through and got everyone else to agree with. It's, it's very much the, the executive members read out reports that are written for them. Um, there's, there's a party line that, that, that doesn't seem to come from them. And also there's the absence of politics. Um, it's difficult enough anyway to tell when Liberal Democrats are being political um, or whether they're not, because there's not always that much of a difference. So where do you think the town is going under the Lib Dems then? It's not going anywhere very fast. Hmm. Um, we stalled. There's, there's, there's something to be said for being an entrepreneurial council and for going out and trying to identify opportunities, for coming up with ideas that no one else has had in the vicinity. Um, so. There's, there's only so much capacity for things. So things like the shopping centre, um, nothing happened there. Most of the other councils in the area, the other ten authorities, all got new town centre development. Stockport didn't. Um, you get to the point where you miss the boat, and there isn't then the capacity to to come back and do it. Uh, there's only so many new shopping centres that the area can support. Hmm. Do you think that um, the opposition, that's the Labour Party, has uh, Got any blame in any of this? Uh, in other words, has it been uh, perhaps as forthcoming as it ought to have been? No, I think the Labour group's fantastic in every way. <laughs> beyond, beyond criticism. 